Hello, dear listeners. Sit back. Make sure your Dom Perignon 53 is chilled below 38 degrees because it's definitely preferable to drinking a rather disappointing brandy. Because, yes, after countless episodes, the Odd Job Pod has now possibly made it to the most iconic film of all. Uh, and joining me, Gary Andrews, as ever, is two men who have the Midas touch when it comes to James Bond podcasting, uh, Terry DeFellin and Graham Sibley. Uh, gentlemen, it's taken a while to get to Goldfinger, but we are here. Are you ready to discuss the iconography, the cliches and uh, the obligatory Austin Powers reference as we go through this podcast? <laughs> as ready as we'll ever be, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm somewhat indifferently blended, Gary, but I think I'll, I'll manage over time. You know, I just just need to cut back on the bonbois, and I should. Be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is before we even get into it. We just, I love how most of the other films we start with kind of a little bit of uh, of chat, and then we're there, and we're instantly into the quotable bits. And to be honest, even if you've only ever seen the posters for Goldfinger, if you've never watched Goldfinger, you've probably already got an idea in your head. If you've never watched Goldfinger, I don't quite know what you're doing listening to a James Bond podcast. Maybe you, you've started off um, and just decided that during lockdown, you you will see if you can uh, can get through. In which case, go back to From Russia With Love, first of all, before you come here, because I think that will be uh, much more uh, preferable. But um, yes, Goldfinger, Graham. Um, some may say probably the quintessential uh, Bond. Um, certainly the one that probably has been uh, parodied the most and and is referenced the most. But um, let's start actually, rather than go through the plot and everything that we're in there, let's start actually at the root of the DNA. Now we've done the podcast, um, several podcasts ago on the DNA of a Bond film. And whilst it was being built and constructed in Dr. No, and uh, from Russia with Love. Um, in Goldfinger, Guy Hamilton, you would probably say, has actually properly established not just the DNA of Bond film, but the formula down to every single sort of cut copy scene you could take from Goldfinger and then just write something else on top of it. And you've probably got a pretty good Bond film. Yep. This is his draw of cookie cutter shapes. And it's right here in this film. If you go into Guy Hamilton's uh, kitchen, there is a drawer, and all it's got in it is little little shapes of metal that are one's the shape of odd job, one's the shape of pussy galore. No, the the actress, not not don't take it literally. Um, and yes, you can take all of these things. One's the DB five, and yes, you you just go there with a big lump of pastry, and you make a Bond film or cookie dough or whatever. Yeah, it's got all the elements in it, and and Terry as well. When you, this is a re, actually, I found I found this a really hard film to start kind of getting into my head. Not because it's a bad film; it's not. It's it's a cracking watch, but also it's really hard to separate um, what Graham's just said, the cookie cutterness of it, by the fact that if you saw this for the first time, especially if you say a, a kind of teenager at the time, this would have probably been like nothing you'd really seen before on screen. Certainly not if you didn't. You know, you've had Doctor No from Russia with Love too. Two really good, solid, I mean, Russia with love, brilliant, but spy caper. Suddenly you've got lasers and you've got, you know, bombs and you've got gold and you've got, and you've got lots and lots of different women you've got in there. And as a teenage boy, I would imagine you would just be, wow. And then also probably if you're an adult, you'll probably be like, wow. Sorry, I'm uh, just imagining a, 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 a lady garden shaped cookie cutter. Um, <laughs> but uh, 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 I think if you're a 13 year old boy, uh, or indeed if you're a 13 year old uh, who, who, who likes who likes the ladies, then you're going to be completely blown away. I think uh, by by the opening of Goldfinger, I should, not the the cold open. I should say the the opening, the the into Miami bit. Welcome to Miami and the and the the poolside scene and just 
something that just blew me away <laughs> when I went to see the film for the first time at the pictures when in my early 40s at the Prince Charles just the sheer number of women in bikinis on, on in that opening scene is just ridiculous it's absolutely absurd and it, I mean if I had been a 13 year old boy at the age of uh, you know at, the, at, at that time walking into a cinema I would have been just beside myself and I, it wouldn't have mattered what happened afterwards. It could have been the worst film ever. I don't think I would have cared. Um, <laughs> but it is an explosive, if you'll pardon the expression, an explosive start because, you know, the, the cold open is just immense, isn't it? It's just so energetic and dynamic and, and, and clearly establishing everything that is just cool about James Bond and why we love him. You know, he, he breaks into complexes he blows stuff up you know he, he he times he times the explosion of his of the drug lab just when he's sparking up a fag and then he goes off and and gets laid uh, or you know would have done were he not rudely interrupted you know in a positively shocking manner and even the humor is in there as well obviously with the with the duck on the head and it's it's just such a, a fantastic way to start any kind of action movie and every time i watch goldfinger i always just i'm instantly involved in this movie just because of that that moment when he just jumps off the wall and knocks out the security guard and, and then bursts off you know they're all full of energy and dynamism it's absolutely fantastic it's a film that we've talked a lot about how bond films establish themselves from the start and you, you pretty much know from those those kind of early scenes what you're going to get but then also the, the kind of the tempo and it's established and it sticks to it. And, and Graham, this film really sticks to what it sets out. It's got humour in there. It's actually probably a lot more lighthearted than, than the previous two en entries in a lot of respects. Um, it doesn't let up. It's got a great pace and tempo. Um, and also it just... It just has confidence. Um, and that, that for me is one thing that I take from it. It's just got confidence about everything oozing from every single pore. Yeah, it's an incredibly sexy film. That's that's the, the, the key to it. Everything about it is just irresistible. It, it is, it, and you can't take your eyes off it, mainly for lustful reasons, because there's, as, as Terry <laughs> says, the bikinis. Uh, but also, you know, the, it's got the beautiful car. It's got, it's got Connery so comfortable in the role as well now the he just and and this is on the cast but after this he he's dialing it in more and more so in the films that, that, that follow this is this is the last great connery film uh bond film uh and so and it and it'll be years before you see another really really mesmerizing performance for, for, from him after this uh and but you've got on a blackman in there who is Brilliant, and Gert Frober uh, as, as as Goldfinger. He's not the most menacing of of Bond villains. Uh, he's he's not even the most sinister. But he, there is just something about him. There is something about the the way that he's, you know, he's just a bumbling golf player. But also as well, he's the guy who almost gets away with it. He almost gets away with his plan because it it is. It's fiendish. It is fiendish in its simplicity, but in also in, in in the fact that he gets this close to actually doing it. And as well, you've got with with, with odd job as well. You've got one of the best henchmen ever. I, I've always said about Goldfinger is that it's eight out of ten in every category, and that's why it, it's so good. It, it that's that's why you could always pick out some element of 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 this film that was done better in another Bond film. But you can't get a Bond film that is so consistent in pretty much every car a, a, a category and timeless as well. And yes, there are things in there that you just couldn't couldn't do do now. But of its time, it is it is on the mark. It's on the money, and I still enjoy watching it. There is still they I never tire of watching this film. For me, it's a film that I have to remember when it was made because it it does feel incredibly modern um given still where it, it was made and, and where we are now this still actually feels like a film that could have, have quite conceivably been made 
um, you know, even 10 years later, because it, it has so many of the elements in there and you wouldn't think anything in there would feel particularly dated or, or outlandish. Um, and let, let's just kind of pick up um, ever so slightly, because as as one sort of slight diversion, I'm sure we'll go down down many different diversions as, as we talk through this film, because it, it is a film that you can sort of hone in on, on various rabbit holes. But Terry, um, Graham talked about Gert Frober, and, and he is undoubtedly one of the keys to the film's success. You know, it's not just all the other elements in there, but you've got a fantastically charismatic actor who, when him and Sean Connery are on the screen, it, it just works. You've got, you know, sparks flying in there, and there's just that hint of menace in there as well. Um, and that, for me, is, is one of the most interesting things about Goldfinger, is just almost how much time Bond spends with the villain. But not just that, that you get a sense, which you don't always get through a lot of Bond films, that you've almost got an equal, not necessarily physic physically, but you've got somebody who is very much a match for Bond, to the point that Bond actually seems to be genuinely impressed by, by his plans, as opposed to contemptuous um, in there. And, and you've got, you know, somebody who has probably outwitted Bond and very nearly outwits Bond many times throughout there and, and actually seems to be enjoying it as well. He's got a, a, a weird good humour. He doesn't ever lapse into the angry, angry villainry that often. Well, he manages to pull off and finesse the, 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 the very, very difficult to pull off trope of the villain explaining his plot to the hero in order for it to be foiled which is a, a necessary plot device for so many of these movies, but very, very difficult to do because, you know, it's like, why would you do that? And he does it effortlessly and it works really well because, yeah, as you say, it's a really, really clever plan, as Graham says. It's, it's fiendish. It's inspired, I believe, is the word that was used. And it's very, very clear that James Bond didn't figure this out. He had to be spoon fed this. You know, they had to sit down, put a mint julep in his hand and, and say, <laughs> go on, come on, you can do this. You know, and in, in, in a way, you know, with the confidence of knowing that he had all of this sewn up, the only way he could possibly fail would be as if somehow Pussy Galore was to betray, betray him. And how could he possibly do, she possibly do that? After all, it's not like some bloke's going to come along and seduce her. Am I right? <laughs> you know, and that's not possible. Am I right? So anyway, I think, I, I mean, the, the, the charm with which he plays the role, there is, there is a, a, a degree of menace in there during the, uh, final exchanges of the golf scene. And I think the, 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 that whole scene at the golf course uh -huh. is just so intriguing, so much fun. It's just like watching it. Would, it's just like a, like it's, it's, it's James Bond playing, gambling with his adversary, playing a, a game of chance. If you like, it's not a game of chance, it's golf, but it's, it's, it's the same. Um, it's the same vibe as like, if he was sitting across a baccarat table with him, you know, uh, uh, but but it obviously it just works so much better because it's beautifully shot. Uh, and there's a, the, the chicanery, the cheating, the double crossing, absolutely superb. But obviously, I think it capped off brilliantly with, you know, you know, Goldfinger's rebuke and threat, which is really, you know, uh, I think very convincing. And of course, Odd Jobs hat, which we see for the first time. And how many times have we seen that clip? of odd job removing the head de decapitating that statue it really is it's just a it's such a common scene it's 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 baked into our culture into our popular culture and i i think that that gert frobe just like just pulls it off just so well obviously his, his voice was done i think he's a it was a voice a vo voice actor wasn't it he was his, his michael was collins done, but, yeah thank you but nevertheless you know the, the 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 exchanges between them are just absolutely fantastic, and it's it 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 makes the it elevates the movie into as Graham said the, the the solid eight out of ten that it is all around. Although I would suggest in some areas it is ten out of ten. Mm. I I would I would agree that there are bits which, and I would probably say if you're talking any scene, certainly my, the golf scene is probably one that. That you know, if it could go all the way up to eleven, it would go all the way up to eleven. It, it's a fantastic piece of cinema. It really is, and actually, one of the slightly slower, more tense moments. And and this is what like one of the things I really like about Goldfinger is that you've got those 
it's getting a bit more gadgety. It's getting a bit more overblown. There are some random exploding cars um, that, that sort of clearly shoddy workmanship in there. Um, but you, you've also just got those elements that are still very much spy bits. You still, you're still not at the point where Bond is ahead of the villain. Or, or all the time. Bond very much is behind the villain here and, and is having to think on his feet. And it, it does, it is a, a, a really great spy film. Um, but just to continue on, on the cast as well, Graham, and, and you touched on this. It, as an eight out of 10, it's also really hard to think of another or other Bond films that just have such a strong cast with such a strong set of screen presence. Because we know Connery can, can, when he's in the mood, can act most other people off the screen he's just got that magnetism that the camera loves but here he's got you know he's got honor blackman he's got shirley eaton he's got um gert Froh, but he's got um he's got so many other great actors around him that it just lifts the game it's obviously um we know the, the limitations of somebody like lazenby but when you're kind of looking at the cast as, as well it's it's almost that bit where you've you know you've managed to get that formula where you get the casting such as having diana rigg and telly savalas that it just ele elevates what is already a good film into a great one and that's where potentially some other later bonds fall down that they have great characterization great plot but there's just something not quite there on the casting side for whatever reason definitely and and i think honor blackman's casting is very important in this obviously she was at the top of her game for this film she wasn't an unknown actress just suddenly chucked in to become a bond girl this this is this is someone who had been in the avengers for the last two years was coming up to the end of her contract there was just getting released and thought right okay i'm going to do this film as a step up and and so everyone was was comfortable in it with her and her, her and her um and, and the whole judo side of it as well so it, it she basically transfers the character from one to the other doesn't she but that allows her to be much more than the ones that the the actresses that had preceded her as the main Bond girl. And really, I mean, it takes a long time before someone else afterwards can can really come up to her level as well. Um, obviously, she's got the advantage over the over Ursula Andress and uh, Daniela Bianchi in the fact that she acts with her own voice in this, whereas <laughs> they didn't. Uh, so, so there is obviously some when when obviously when when you dub someone, you lose something of 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 the of the of the of the act, uh, of the acting there, uh, and, and so she's already a much more well rounded character, and and you and you invest so much more in her. I mean, apart from the fact that she's absolutely stunning uh, as well in it, but she but she carries it off so well. And uh, it's just a shame that it's, it's about halfway through the film that she turns up. I mean, it's like you really want to have more of her on the screen. And uh, luckily, when when, well, uh, when she does appear, then she's pretty much on there all the time. Um, uh, so, so I think that's obvious. Uh, and as well, you've got um, the change of direction in this film as well with with Guy Hamilton also uh, has something to bear on that as well because uh, it, he develops a lot more of the side characters as well and and they're a lot more rounded in this one. And Q's, I'm sure we're going to come to uh, uh, soon, but uh, it is a good example of that. Uh, and, that's, and that's purely down to him and his direction. So uh, there is that that also brings this, that makes this step up a level and also defines what is to follow. It's, there's so much that, that's iconic about it. And yeah, as you said, Graham, like when you look at the template and again, when, when we kind of talk about when people say they are going back to Bond, they normally probably reference Connery and, and the early Connery films um, because they're just so iconic and well shaped. But then you will always get whoever the Bond girl is. It's like, yeah, no, we're going we're going to be that sort of tough Bond girl, the equal of Bond. Um and you probably suspect that they are referencing all the way back to to Anna Blackman because she is the first one who who really kind of steps up and is is you know uh, that level of of challenging Bond and just will not brook any nonsense from him and it's it's a bit of a development and on that sense Terry it's welcome but if we are going to take a very slight diversion into its faults you've got to say this is 
out of all the Bond entries, this is probably the one that uh, also scores an eight out of ten, at least on the misogyny scale. It's really because one of the most obviously one of the most iconic scenes is the um, is the the woman covered in paint, Shirley Eaton in the in uh, on the publicity stills. Sorry, Shirley Eaton in the film and Margaret Nolan in the publicity still. It, I mean, but it is it is a particularly grisly form of murder. Um, and and I, I mean, I know that there are people who have, 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 have criticised the film greatly for, for, in general, the portrayal of women and the attitudes by the male characters towards the women from, you know, man talk and and, and, and then obviously, you know, the, the, the murder of, of, of Jilly Masters, Jill Masters and, as well. Uh, some of this, of course, is, you know, in in the story it's it moves the story forward it's not without value it's got to be said but nevertheless the i think where people where the movie doesn't hold up uh, it, you know it's a modern audiences is, is is in obviously it's, is its tone uh, rather than necessarily the narrative I, I wouldn't necessarily characterize the violence as as you know unnecessary or gratuitous uh, per se but but nevertheless uh, I, I think it would be handled very very differently Today I say that, but obviously Strawberry Fields got covered in dipped in oil in Quantum of Solace, didn't they? And that was only what you know, turned 13 years ago. So, so I don't know. I mean, and you know, it, it is a it is a thing that goes through James Bond movies that, as James Bond fans, we have to reconcile ourselves ourselves with. Mm. It's it's a film that, um, yeah. I mean, again, very much of its time as well um, with there and. You know, if if we were going to devote every podcast to to it, uh, there's a lot to pick apart, and we have picked apart some some of the more uncomfortable bits. So it's it's certain kind of worth flagging. But then, Graham, when you kind of go back to to the other elements in there, I mean, I guess it's 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 part of what makes Bond Bond, um, but also enables you probably to. Or, or you know, and this might be a bit of a stretch, but you can kind of see when um, you moved up to, say, uh, the Brosnan era and you have Judy Dench coming in as M. It enables them to actually write a character who does challenge Bond as this kind of misogynistic dinosaur. And everybody knows where it's come from. And and it's come through from this film. So it's it's an interest. I find it interesting, bit uncomfortable. This is the first like I'm watching it. I had a little bit of a mm, at some bits, although, you know, overall, as, as Terry said, it's a, it's still a, a great film to watch. But you can also kind of see how it's probably the one element. If we talk about all the elements that are kind of cookie cutter throughout. It's probably the one element where you can see producers from time to time have struggled with how do we reconcile where Bond has been so clearly established as basically a bit of a sexist pig in Goldfinger. Not that he wasn't a bit beforehand, but but he really was here. Um, how do we reconcile this with what the modern audience wants? And that's probably been one of the, the biggest problems that Goldfinger's given for Bond over the years. Uh, yeah, it is. I There is a lot of things about Bond that lends itself to criticism, especially to modern audiences and to modern sensibilities. But, uh, of course, what we have to face up with is the fact that Bond is like this because the world is like this. There is no doubt about it. When you look at, at Goldfinger, who immediately springs to mind in the modern world? Who immediately springs to mind, incredibly rich, likes to surround himself with blondes and likes to cover everything in gold and was up until recently the president of the United States of America and <laughs> loves a bit of golf too. I mean, he's there. He was the template for him. And of course, is is an incredi- is incredibly sexist, of course. It, so it, it, it's not as if the world has changed in this time. No, there is still is true. a ridiculous amount of misogyny around in the world. Back then, it was treated as a joke. And, you know, you could remake this film today and you could still have exactly the same amount of misogyny in there and no one would think, well, this is entirely unbelievable. Well, this, is, this is not, not how the world, the world works because it is, it, it is entirely that's how, how the world operates. And, uh, yes, it's horrible, but it's, it's, it's the truth. Um, I know it, it, the, the, there is always the... the casting issue whenever a new the, the talk of a new bond comes around and they say oh well they should make it a woman they should make it they should make it a black bond and and this always comes up and it's well yes if we lived in a world where 
a black woman could rise to commander in the Royal Navy and it, would, and it wouldn't be headline news, then yes, maybe we could live in a world where, where James Bond is, is black or is a woman. The fact that Bond can walk into a hotel lobby in Hong Kong dripping wet in rags and get the best suite in the house is a sign of white privilege. And that's always got something that that Bond has always expressly just just highlighted. And the reason why people hate Bond is exactly why the reason why it's so popular, because it shows those things off and it holds up a mirror and says, look, this is the world you live in. If you don't don't like it, say something about it, do something about it and try to make make a change. But at the moment, it's still going to be like this in another 50 years time, because it will be. That needs mm. to say you don't need to like, like throw Bond in the bin because this this reflects a world that actually exists, doesn't it? But I think I think that I, I'm a lot more reconciled to the way Bond is. There are things in there that I think no, that's uh, that that adds nothing to the film. That adds nothing to the situation. That that should be got rid of. Um, and I would not have any problem if certain elements of it were were cut out. I don't think it would lo- you'd lose anything from the film. Maybe not in this film, but but certainly not in other films in the canon. We'll have the opportunity to discuss this again in the next movie because the next movie is Thunderball, which yeah. and in some there are some scenes in that which are which are truly horrific. Yeah, which 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 I think I so. Think we'll come I back guess we can. Yeah. I guess we can. We can. We can. We can discuss this again in the next in the next podcast as well. One of the things that also really struck me about this, and you you talk about the kind of. Um, some of those those elements which, which you know wouldn't necessarily have been thought of in the sixties, but um, one thing that really struck me, perhaps more so the, than it has done in quite a while, having watched Doctor No and from Russia with Love immediately preceding this, is actually this to me feels like it's one of the it's probably the first film that really taps into that snobbish element of bond that comes through in the books terry you've you've got the you know you've got the lecture on the disappointing brandy you've got the <laughs> the line about my dear there are some things which will not do don Perignon above 30 degrees you've got that element which perhaps wasn't there previously because you know of, of potentially of connery of who he was he you know he's a, he's a scottish bodybuilder who who comes from a very different world but by the time we've talked about how confident connery is by the time he's he's got to goldfinger and again this is the kind of probably one of the the first connery film where it's got that that snobbishness that that sort of slight arrogance in there that maybe wasn't quite you know it's, it's always been there but there is definitely an, a, a kind of arrogance in there this is is potentially a film that while it is connery's film you know so many of the lines could have easily been delivered by roger moore and you could have seen him having a great time at this as, as his, in his peak as well um it feels like this is this is the one that suddenly clicks and because it clicks it's clicked with the, the character in the book not that the two films before didn't but this is one that terry for me that i don't know how you feel but it's got that that element of fleming comes through so loud and clear probably because of, of the source material as well yeah it, it's it's a it's the element of the bond character that that sean connery masters uh in, in by this third film and, and and rounds rounds out the character and makes it as you say on the authentic Fleming character that 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 line you know indifferently blended with an overdose of Bombois could easily has been said by Roger Moore uh, and it would have it would have but probably the overlap is absolute com- absolutely complete kind of just I'd say I love that scene the thing that really got got me about re-watching this quite recently was just how much I enjoyed the unbridled snobbery and 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 and, <laughs> and, and just public school awfulness of that scene I absolutely <laughs> bathed in it absolutely bathed in it <laughs> thanks 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 uh in 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 large part to richard, richard vernon oh yeah colonel smithers if you if any of you listeners uh, ever watched uh yes minister and yes prime minister he eventually goes on to become the governor of the bank of england in 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 yes prime minister and he's and every time I see Colonel Smithers, I'm instantly thinking of Desmond Glazebrook in, in, in Yes, Prime Minister, who plays this bumbling, harmless, 
yet incredibly wealthy uh, a, a public school boy. And they barely age. I mean, Jess Prime Minister was in the 80s and, and this was in the 60s. And like, you wouldn't you wouldn't know. Apparently, I think Richard Vedder was about 29 when he, when, when he made Goldfinger. But it's just, you know, they aged much more quickly back then. And it, it's, a, it's an impeccable scene. And I love just how like M is sort of, it's like a, just a little sniffing at the brandy as to say, well, what's going on here? Just like that subtle humour, which is, I just found absolutely rich. I mean, in a different context, it's utterly, utterly offensive. These ex-public school officer class snobs, you know, carving up the world, just handing over bars of gold like they were loose change. It's, it's utterly offensive. But but, but I, I just love, I love that. It's so good. 39. What, what was 39 years? 39, well, 39 was he? he was 39 years old. And, <laughs> he was anyway. 39 years old. Slatty Bartfast. <laughs> <That> is- <laughs> <laughs> yes, Slarty Bart, Bartfast as well, of course. Yeah, I, I, I forget. But what? A, I mean, an, an impeccable. I mean, you know, hats off to the casting, of course, because it is in, impeccable casting. But that is such a glorious scene. And uh, sorry, Gary, what was the question? <laughs> I, I'm just, I, 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 I was with you there. I was following you all the way. But I was so, are you not just, you not just bathing yourself. You, you thrown that brandy. So I was bathing in it from all the way in Australia as well. It, it's, it's a fantastic scene. Um, yeah, it, it was more that the, the, the snobbery, the fact that this is, is when you talk about the quintessential bond, I think the reason this is a quintessential bond for me is because it masters the elements of Fleming's novels that hadn't, or Connery masters the elements of Fleming's novels that potentially hadn't come through quite as strongly in Doctor No and from Russia with Love. And, and, and as you said, like, you know, there is, this is the point where you could see this crossover into into the Moore era and, and probably, you know, you could see Brosnan, you could see Craig delivering that line. Dalton would have probably done it slightly differently, but he's the only Bond that I, I could potentially see would have, have um, probably just sort of scowled a bit more. Um, but it is a, it, it's one where this, this whole scene is the one which I, for me, is like, right, this is the point where you have crossed over into a different, in, in, into what we know and love as, and, and, and have problems with, but know as Bond um, today. That was my. That was wasn't even a question. It was just a point. That yeah. Just, it, it, the, the other th- the other the other line, of course, is the Beatles uh, listening to the Beatles without earmuffs, <laughs> which follows your your th- your thing, which is a desperately desperately uncool thing to say, um, and would have been even more so at the time. And of course, with uh, with Richard Vernon, uh, he played um, Grumpy Guy on the train in Hard Day's Night, uh, which came out at the same time. Uh, <laughs> Which Margaret Nolan was also in as a as a as a as a buxom casino girl. <laughs> Graham, let's go into the other elements because we we you know we've we've bathed in some of the the brilliant scenes and and a lot of them are actually I think a, lo- a lot of the ones that we love about this film. Once it starts getting into the action, you're into the action, but it's those early setups that are, are so good. And as we've kind of alluded on. You suddenly rounded out the characters of M a little bit more. I love the interplay between Bond and, and M in this film, even though it's not there much. You've got the classic Q lines, Desmond Llewellyn suddenly moving on from from being Major Boothroyd to to being a, a returning character with just um, you know that you know what you're going to get. You've got those um, you know that talk through the gadgets in there, which seems so very familiar. But then again, having watched the other two, it is a step up that's totally different from from in the previous films. Um, and so yeah, the, Graham, this this is this is a film that doesn't just set the template it sets a template for the whole world around bond the little the, the characters that sit as a supporting cast continually certainly and especially q q is is developed into a character rather than someone who just explains the gadgets and like the development within bond's gadgets themselves he has developed as a character so like you know, you walk in with us with a briefcase with some gold sovereigns hidden in it well done Okay, that, but this time you've got a car, and you've got a car with just everything on it. Everything on it. It's it is just incredible. It's got so much stuff on it. They don't even bother using it all in the film. They, 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 there, there is things on the on the original Dinky toy. They had uh, um, the the bumpers. The the, the 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 bumpers used to have bits that came out the front. 
that was never used in the film. It was actually, but it was actually made into the into the into the car, and, the, and it was one of the, the the things that was in the script, but it was written out of the script, but obviously not for the for the design of the car. But that, I mean, the 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 scene where he's explaining that the DB five is just is just brilliant, and and it is it is it is one of the finest scenes in in all of Bond uh, because it is it is so played so well, and the two of them have got such a good chemistry on there, uh, and of course it it has been repeated pretty much every film since then. There is there. There's got a Q scene. When you go into 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 the Q lab, you know you're onto a good thing thing because there, there's going to be something funny in this, and they always <laughs> lift it up and up and up. Uh, and and you, you always think back to to really really good ones like uh, in in Octopussy or um yeah. or, or Moonraker <laughs> should we say yes yeah let's let's say Moonraker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Spy loved me too as well. Yes, of course, of course. Wood, <laughs> yeah. Wood knew, Wood knew, didn't he? He knew what to do with Q, didn't he? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> uh, and and Money Penny as well. Money Penny gets gets a, a, a bit more rounding out to her character as well. And it, it's only what because before we started doing these uh, the Connery films uh, during the the early days of lockdown, I went through a whole rewatch of the whole lot. And it was only afterwards that I started thinking about the character of Money Penny. It was, it was when I when when I got to, to to the Craig era ones, and they started thinking about you know, well, field work's not for everyone, and and then I, I started thinking back to the low, to the Lois Maxwell character, and I thought, all right, American accent, right? Obviously she, she's Canadian, but I thought American accent wouldn't it be great if it's an open secret that she's a CIA mole? And just everyone knows it, but they can't do <laughs> anything about it. And then when you when you when you look at it from that way, when you see all her scenes, they, they become even better. That she's reporting them all the way back to <laughs> to, to lighter or something in the states. <laughs> Everything that's going on in M's office. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, one of those un, those unofficial yet official um, uh, back channels yeah. that, that you have. Yes, yeah, she's she's so she's effectively a double agent, but a friendly double agent. Yeah, yeah who's a, like works for the Allies and us. Yeah, but I, I like the fact that it's a completely everyone knows it as well, and there's nothing they can do about it. Let's just say yeah. it. They probably they probably depend on it. Yeah. We, we could we could we, we need some unofficial help from the CIA, so let's just like drop this on her desk. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Felix, you're here. I wonder how that happened. <laughs> I was just thinking. I was just thinking. I was just talking about you to Money Penny just the other day. What a coincidence! <laughs> Uh, there is, I, there's so much to love about it, and there's so many other things you just kind of want to touch on. So, Terry, I'll throw this one over to you. Two other um, elements that I think really hit their stride in this one, um, which are elements which I'm sure you you will have strong thoughts, feelings, opinions, and and the rest on. Which is one of which is you've got Ken Adam back in doing the production design, and and is given a bit more to to really let fly at this point. He's not quite there with being able to get away with his uh, his volcano lair, but he is definitely having a lot of fun with the production design. And then you've just got what is possibly one of the best pieces of soundtrack all the way through the the music is just superb and again sets the template for for bond the the look the feel and the sound of the film is as important to the success of this as 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 the other elements yeah i mean actually i feel actually as though i should could maybe pass over the, the 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 main remarks of the soundtrack over to graham because i know that this is his favorite james bond soundtrack um, and and i listen to and love almost almost all of them even the ones i hate i still listen to but um, graham is, is a bit more discerning about his bond soundtrack but i know that he partic- has a particular love for this one and i'm sure he'll tell you about the uh, the driving through the alpine mountains and <laughs> i have been in a car with graham while we've been driving admittedly through the Surrey Hills and he's put on that track uh, he, he absolutely adores it so maybe he can say that but for me that is a 10 out of 10 that is the that is the best sound Bane James Bond soundtrack uh, and, and I will fight anyone who says different um, the, yeah Ken Adam though I think probably my, my favourite Ken Adam scene is probably Goldfinger's um, office come <laughs> pool table come the, that, the, the whole scene where he, where he explains his caper to the 
to the to the gangsters before killing them, which is brilliant. He totally <laughs> kills. He like, why? No, there's no reason to do that. So, no, I'm going to tell them exactly what's going on, and then I'm going to gas them all to death. It's going to be brilliant. You know, I'm just so on board with that. And I just, I think that's that's really good. I mean, I mean, you could talk about like the. I mean, I imagine obviously the Fort Knox set was not the actual Fort Knox, but but probably largely built on that. But I think that the, Ken Adams' creativity comes, you know, in in that particular scene probably the strongest i would i would suggest um and the laser scene as well of course which is just like pure ken adam that's probably using the same shed that they used for dr no and just <laughs> redressed it. Uh, and it and it looks good i mean we've not even talked about like you know i mean we're too deep cut i think for the obvious one-liners aren't we but i mean like you know i mean the, the no mr bond i expect you to die just that whole sequence has got there's so much tension in that sequence it's unbelievable but but yeah perhaps graham can feel the second point about uh, about the soundtrack yeah yes well yes I, I i do like like to be on the nose when it comes to the uh, to the goldfinger soundtrack uh <laughs> five years ago uh i my wife and i went on a on a road trip down the east coast of of the states and we started in boston and we went all the way down to key west and uh and as we were coming off i-95 into miami i did hook my phone up to the to the convertible mustang stereo that we were in and uh, and yes i played into miami <laughs> You've got to. Yes. You've absolutely got to. I mean, if I ever went driving through the Swiss Alps, I'd put on, you know, you know, you know the Swiss Alps, you know, thing. I mean, it's it's such a, it, it's there's so much. I mean, it's a brilliant melody to the main theme, yeah. and Bon and Barry, John Barry, you know, it's completely shameless in just like weaving that in, and it sits perfectly with the with, with Monty Norman's theme. I mean, yeah. And 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 also, it's just got such a great. He said that such a, it's contemporary to the mid 1960s. It's a really cool sound. It's a lovely, it's a lovely, rich soundtrack. Yeah, and again, it's confidence as well, isn't it? Which, which is the, the thing that yes. runs through everything in this film is the confidence of knowing that what you're going to do is going to work, and it comes off really well. And that's that's what really mm. comes into it. The, the the thing I like most about about the soundtrack as well is the way that it works in with the general soundscape of the film, uh, especially the sound of the laser. Um, the, that's that's half of the, the the thing of the of the of the of that the, of the laser scene is the music, the rising music in there, mm. but also the sound of the laser, the hum of it, the, the, and, the and the way it's mm. cutting through the the, uh, the table and and you know the lines in it are the are, are obviously they're the ones that get they get the headlines they 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 are they are the headline grabbers, but. Uh, everything everything goes about that to build the tension in that scene and it's so good the fight at, in Fort Knox with with odd job when it's just got that sound in the background that that sort of mm. pulsing noise to build up mm. the tension uh, oh god that's brilliant that is so good i mean it's such a good scene anyway it is it is it is just just brilliant and, and as you say the set is just is just fantastic um but yeah, everything, everything about that it is it, the way that it all comes together, and and I think it's, it is it's the confidence to try those things and the confidence to go through it and say, yeah, this is going to work because we've tried things like this before, but I know what to do to make it even ten times better. Oh, I've got a little bit more budget this time, even better. Yeah, this is the thing, isn't it? I mean, this is what it all smacks of, isn't it? It's like gone. They've gone dots in their front. They said wouldn't it be cool if we could do this again ken adam and he's like oh i've got this great idea for a vo volcano and they go well we're not you know not not the end you've got your shed <laughs> and, okay and, it, and it, now it's you know now it's a garage but i mean you, you know we, we, we're getting there but it's it, it, it is you're right graham it's because it's also confidence based on the fact that they've done it twice before so like they've got experience yeah. now uh and dare i say pedigree and they can go right yeah we actually know what we're doing and we're massively on point and they also probably instinctively understand what their audience wants to see as well Mm. It, it's really when you look at a lot of the other bonds even the ones that are good i think this is the reason why some of them struggle to to get up to goldfinger's level and why goldfinger for me is is probably always there or thereabouts in this kind of the top three four of of most people's bond films if not the top bond film for a lot of people is as you've mentioned is that solid eight out of ten rising to ten out of ten that it's just the extra elements you can have a really really good bond film 
but there are if there are elements those little bits which don't quite lift it up uh, above then that's potentially where you you just kind of it stalls from being a great a good film into a or a great film into just one that is just stunning and, and excellent and you can kind of see that probably for me with that that latter bit of of connery certainly where there's there's elements which and part of it is connery obviously starting to phone it in a little bit more but there is even though there's a lot that's still kind of working in there and certainly you know you only live twice which isn't one of my favorites but it's probably one of ken adams strongest and also probably from a soundtrack perspective one of the strongest but then it there's bits which doesn't quite match up with, with with other elements in there. And it's why, for me, Goldfinger is always going to be one of the best that you, having rewatched it, you know, a couple of days before this podcast, I've suddenly gone, yeah, I, it's just hard to pick holes with anything. If you're trying to look at it critically, you just can't, other than the, the element of misogyny that we've picked up on, you just can't really pick it apart. You can't go, mm, well, that could have been done a bit better here. You're just like, just enjoy it. The the, the whole ride is is absolute an absolute blast. It goes through, it just rattles through at a fantastic pace. And you don't ever feel that you are, you don't feel that you've ever got time to, to stop and go to the bathroom at all. Not that you need to, it's one of the, the shorter ones in the entry. But there are certain bits l- latterly on Um And uh, dare I say that when you get to a film like Spectre, there are certainly elements where you can go, I've got a couple of minutes to make a cup of tea here. (laughs) Probably just duck out. (laughs) It's fine. (laughs) Yeah, it wouldn't be. Because also it works with Spectre because like, you know, normally you say, oh, I'll just pause it and go and make a cup of tea. And like we expect to say, no, 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 I'll just leave it running. <laughs> 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 no, it's fine. I like, watch Spectre and I like, guess I'm just going to nip to the bathroom. Like, You're not going to pause it? Nah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going for a stand up? Nah, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, in fairness, the listeners, you know, inferred enough without you having to, you know, make, make that clear. But yeah, now that you mention it. <laughs> <laughs> yes do, do not watch this film if uh if if you've had a few drinks beforehand part not because you won't enjoy it but partly because your bladder will probably not stand out into there um it is it, one of the things that i love doing this podcast is that you know yes we we have fun with the the films that potentially can pick apart but it's quite rare that we get to discuss a film which there's just so much you just get stuck into how much you could enjoy i mean i know that we could probably quite easily go on for another hour about other bits and pieces and probably pick apart the film in minute detail not picking apart but just picking apart why we love different different elements of it um terry one thing that you you did mention though um i think before we started recording was that if you had one flaw in criticism, it is that final bit of climax with Bond. The choreography of the massive falling down of all the US troops is is just unconvincing. Uh, I mean, I know there's troops and I know that they're incredibly disciplined, <laughs> but, but you know, they're, they all just like collapse. They just all like, go like that. I mean, I don't, I mean, like when the gangsters were killed by Delta 9, they were like fighting it and it was like, it was, it was quite horrific, you know, actually, whereas these guys, they just dropped like stones. And like, for me, it was just like massively unconvincing. What, like, what, 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 is, what is this, Graham? You know, when we were doing this pre-show, you didn't have any objections then. Come on then. Let's, let's, <laughs> uh, what's, what's, what's your problem? We'll start off. The, 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 the gangsters were actually gassed. Right. And, yeah. and the okay. soldiers were pretending they were gassed. And they were. Yes. <laughs> and but not they in were an acting way. Very well, though. Because, <laughs> no, uh, I know that. I, I understand that. <laughs> I, I, have, I have watched the film, you know, several times. Well, yeah, I know. I mean, but, but the, <laughs> the, the actors were pretending that they were being gassed when they actually were being gassed in, in, so, in the story. But in that the soldiers were. were, were, were collapsing because they were told to collapse and that's how they were directed so that it it, it it it's just a question of poor direction from whoever was was coordinating the troops to collapse on the ground isn't it so it's perfectly what, what believable you're, what you're what you're saying then is is that the the, the floor in goldfinger's plan wasn't that pussy galore could could actually have been turned from being a lesbian into not being a lesbian by james bond 
but actually that he didn't position anyone high enough to be able to observe the troops as they were being gassed and go, hang on, that's not very convincing. I reckon we've been rumbled here, fellas. Well, well they were. You know who they... would have needed for that? <laughs> He would have needed Mike Dean. Mike Dean would have been able to spot whether they were falling wrong. <laughs> anyway, he would he would have been straight there. Goldfring had hired Mike Dean. Then this would have had a very different ending. I, I, I don't know how an observer would have seen. I, I don't know how Delstein works. I mean, like you know, it, it, maybe it does work like that. Maybe it does. I don't know. <laughs> well, I must confess, it does. It, 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 I, I, it, and I'm. I've become unnecessarily preoccupied with it, and every time I see it, it checks it checks me out it, for just for a few moments. I mean, it's a it's a wonderful scene because obviously the heist is actually superb, and brilliantly executed. But I mean, sorry, Graham, go but on. I, I think I think it's perfect. I mean, that is the most realistic, and that is more realistic than than, than, than the hoodlums in in the uh, be pretending to, who are actually being gassed in a pretend way, um, because <laughs> <laughs> because. The the actual troops there were, were actual troops. They were they were they were they were troops that were used as extras. Um and they were told like when the plane goes over, you fall out on the floor. And Really? Yeah. Because I thought they were all actors. <laughs> well they weren't extras, thought, were they? I thought they hired every single actor in the United States <laughs> well, they, of America. They were actual they were actual soldiers, they weren't they weren't extras. Well, they weren't totally in, troops, in, don't in, know, yeah. So they were just being ordered to just fall over. So uh, I'm being I'm being extremely unkind because actually that's an incredibly difficult sequence to choreograph. And they probably only could have done it in one take they or did, maybe yeah. a few takes. Because like <laughs> after all, they're soldiers. Yeah. You don't want to be wasting their time. So, <laughs> sorry, that's, that wasn't quite convincing enough. Can you be a little bit more? Can you writhe around a little bit more? You know? <laughs> they all got paid 10 bucks and a bottle of beer. That's how much they got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm bit, yeah. So I look, I appreciate you uh, because I, because I mean, as much as I've seen this movie so many times, I've rarely had the opportunity to discuss this scene with anybody. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, because it's just such a ridiculously niche scene and a pointless <laughs> and a pointless gripe. So why would I burden people with this? But I've had this forum and this platform, and I feel better about it good, now, and I, I'm grateful to you. I'm, for that. I, I, I always think it's good. It's better to have these things out in the open, don't you, Gary? <laughs> absolutely absolutely i mean we we know we know where terry has got his opinions now and and i think we feel all the better for it and and you know i feel if if moonraker was me getting a lot off my chest i think terry now probably has had a lot of catharsis after i can, I can genuinely i can genuinely move on from this i really can <laughs> oh, it's another moonraker moment isn't it <laughs> it's my Moonraker moment, only it just doesn't have the rather, you know, sort of like, you know, rather disturbing daddy issues associated with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> I did think, I think I mentioned, um, I might have mentioned off on, on the last pod, um, I can't remember, but this was actually the first Bond film that I, I can remember seeing, and <clears> I think my dad sat down and showed me. And I think this is one of his favorites as well. But um, Graham, you can kind of see uh, after the last kind of hour of chat, you can see why this film appeals to so many people and why it is still referenced continually in pop culture, even though, you know, we're now in 2021. You could easily put up you know any kind of reference from from some of the main bits of goldfinger and people would get it instantly even if they're not a bond fan even if they've not seen it this is a film that has a legacy way probably way beyond bond yeah totally totally i mean this is this is the start of where you see all the 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 bond ripoffs isn't it around from this period onwards so it, it's it's all those ones that that parody it, but also the ones that try to do semi-serious um, takes of Bond as well. So uh, there, and there are so many of them in this in this mid '60s period um, that it it does become sort of like um, ground zero for 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 everything that that, that, that follows or or every way that you you're going to take the spy genre. If you a lot of uh, a lot of it goes complete parody. A lot of it goes quite serious, so you, you you're going more into the sort of like the Ipcris file sort of style mode, mode, and then you've got ones that go even more serious than that, uh, and and yeah, and then you have the, the the genuine parodies or the ones that 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 try to copy this but just become parodies in themselves, whether or not they're trying to be serious or not. 
Uh, and of course, that goes on into the 90s and uh, get the buzzer out because here it comes. <laughs> um, yeah, it, you get to Austin Powers. <laughs> Bing. <laughs> Uh, and and yeah, and there's so many of the things that are in this film that that do come into 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 that. And what can you say? This this is because this does it so well, isn't it? It, it is the fact that 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 they have a lot of ridiculous films, a uh, lot of ridiculous things in this film. But you you get completely carried away with it because it's such a good story. So there are ridiculous things in this film. It's full of ridiculous films. It's not just about the soldiers falling down. It is there are loads of things in here that are utterly ridiculous. Don't look at the plot because you know although we say oh it's a very, it's, it's actually quite a fiendish uh, um, um, plan he's got there. It's completely ridiculous. And so is his, <laughs> he does ridiculous things all the way through these films. Why not kill Solo in the room? No, instead, what he does, he puts him in the back of a brand new Lincoln Continental with a load of gold in it and then puts it in a car crusher and then has to unpick the car to try and get these gold back. <laughs> what was the point? If you're going to kill him and you're going to kill the other ones, do it in the same room. I mean... Follows the golden rule of all of the, of the great James Bond films is, is it sets the tone at the beginning of the movie no. and doesn't deviate all the way through. Doesn't and, and and it tells you you're going to be watching yep, something it, it, it ridiculous. Does. So you know, get get strapped in, and then by the point you you get to the point where they've got the 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 oh, the, yeah. the totally, car crushing totally scene, you're completely yeah. bought into it anyway, and you've forgotten everything as well. And 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 that's why it works. And the other, it also follows the other golden rule, and that is despite the film's humour. Uh, and we've discussed yeah. this before is like take yourself seriously yeah. you know be, be serious this is a this is a proper serious film then take it seriously be good at it and this is where it's rivals where it's contemporaries like or it's uh, dare i say it's 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 spin-offs like i'm our man flint and matt helm for example as enjoyable movies as they are you know they 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 don't take yeah. themselves seriously and so why should the audience take it seriously and that's a really, really vital component of, of making a movie like this is no matter how ridiculous you have it going on, if the filmmakers are treating you treating it seriously, then, you know, it's going to be a good film. And, and you know, it's it's probably it's it's so lucky for the franchise that they were able to combine all these elements together in this one movie, because it is possible that uh, this one, if it had been a stinker. And that probably would have been the end of the Bond franchise, as we know, at least for a while. There wouldn't have been, well, I was going to say there wouldn't have been Thunderball, but that may not actually be a bad thing. Um, but I mean, we would have been denied, you know, one of the one of the great genre films of all, genre films of all time, and that would have been a tragedy. Mm. It's there, there's so many elements in there that that just. Yeah, they, they come together absolutely perfectly. So, um, Graham, it feels like a, 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 actually an appropriate question to kind of finish up on, and Terry's touching on on Thunderball, which we're going to come to next. But um, did Goldfinger set the bar just so high that actually pretty much whatever else came after it, certainly in the Connery era, um, and probably throughout the rest of the franchise, has just found it really hard to live up to, even if it's not necessarily everybody's favourite film, not necessarily the view that everybody thinks this is the best film, but it's the film that got so many elements right, it established the template. How hard must it have been for, for the rest of the franchise to then live up to and, and try and top Goldfinger, given how good a film it is? Well, you can see by the is. number of callbacks there are to it. Uh, in 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 the way that that the films are produced, uh, it owes so much to to this film, uh, which is no bad thing. You, you I'd, I'd quite happily watch a Bond film with the DB five in it, or with someone picking up a hat and throwing it. It's it is, it it it, it it's it's perfectly acceptable to to tap back into this film. I think. For, for the Bond franchise, and it should be encouraged to do so, up to a certain point, obviously. Um, but things like the musical cues, uh, as well, are things that that we've that we've that we've talked about as well in in other films, and to say how it harkens back to 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 this early era, this this Connery era. But as you say, uh, Gary, we we we've also spoken lots about the 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 DNA of a Bond film, and this is where it gets hard coded. Uh, and so this is where you hit on, yeah, it could have gone easily, gone from, gone one way or the other. 
just so happens that, that Goldfinger was perhaps the biggest success they ever had. And, and you know, yes, here we are waiting for the next film to come out. And there almost certainly will be another one after that as well. Terry, um, any final thoughts from you other than the fact that I can tell that you're still thinking how you would direct about a thousand army troops to fall down <laughs> properly? <laughs> what, yeah, what's your kind of final summing up of, of Goldfinger? <laughs> I can only really echo what, what, what Graham said. I mean, it, it did set the template. And, and I think I suspect that, you know, the tendency is, is that, you know, when when they're not quite certain what to do next for a Bond movie, they just like dust off the Goldfinger plot and, and, and or, or, or at least the setup and do that. The whole idea of, you know, what we need to do is we need to have a criminal who wants to rob the world of this particularly valuable resource or, you know, destabilize this area of the economy. You know, and we 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 see that. Let's it's a, it's it's very much you know a thing that supervillains like to do. It, it, not only in in James Bond, but but in real life as well. Actually, so <laughs> in many ways, it's it's the the motivations behind the the, the setup and behind the plan are, are are very real world. Bluntly, you know, so you know it's not it's a, it's a, it's very very capitalist. I don't really have much more to say, to be honest with you. I mean, it, in many ways, it's the authentic and if you like the original James Bond movie. Uh, and, and it, you know, in a way that from Russia with Love, although that is the official winner of the World Cup of James Bond films, it, it, Goldfinger is, is the original Bond movie in the way that from Russia with Love isn't because Russia, Russia with Love is moving towards Goldfinger. And yet in, in many ways, it's only really, I think, been rivaled in its, in, in its influence, possibly by, I would suggest to you, Spy Who Loved Me, uh, and I would probably suggest to you Casino Royale. You know, I, I, if you were to carve up the various, and um, maybe GoldenEye, although I know people have got probably GoldenEye, but if you were to take the pivotal movies of the Bond franchise, in my opinion, you know, those are the ones where the franchise is lifted significantly for one reason or another by by those particular movies. Uh, and, 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 you know, obviously Goldfinger is the first and it, yeah, it, it has a legacy that continues on and it will be referenced. If they're making James Bond in 50 years time, they will still be nodding to Goldfinger and probably ripping off elements of the plot and pinching lines from it. I can think of no higher accolade, frankly, to the movie. Mm. It, it is overall a fantastic film. Um, and yeah, it, it's it's one of the things that I love doing about this podcast is it gives me a chance to revisit the films that I love as well as the films that that potentially I've I've re um, redone my opinions on. Um, but I think that's a good place to sum up and and to finish up as uh, as the credits say in Goldfinger, uh, James Bond will return in Thunderball, as will the Odd Job Pod, and as will I'm sure some some slightly more. Uh, interesting opinions, perhaps not all of them universally positive when we come to it. Um, and uh, yes, I mean, obviously, we, we've discussed how that uh, you can you can disappear for a little bit in some films. Be interesting to see uh, how much we've gone for number two in uh, Thunderball <laughs> in there. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I bid you farewell, dear listener. We will return soon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.